I know we're doing kind of a quick transition here, but unfortunately we need to do that in the interest of time because we need to end punctually. Mm. So I'd be grateful if everybody would take their seats in the audience and we will just plunge right in. <clears throat> and basically what we want to do here in this panel on creating the enabling regulatory framework for public-private partnerships is a deeper dive on the role of government as an enabler. And that is a topic that we addressed, of course, a number of times today and also yesterday. It's been emphasized again and again at the summit that we need proactive policymaking for effective partnerships. And that was particularly true in our financial session yesterday when we heard very clear calls for government to play an active role with measures that alter risk perceptions in regard to particular projects or investment categories. And we've also heard mention of subjects like green procurement in which government can act as a first mover and essentially lead by example. So we've got an excellent panel to explore those and other issues in this session and to highlight best practices, identify challenges, and also talk about opportunities. And I'll just now introduce them again. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go for n names and titles, and hopefully you can look at the website if you'd like more information on our speakers. So I'll start right here on my right with the Minister of Finance of Denmark, His Excellency Christian Jensen. Thank you. Welcome. Great to have you with us. Thank you. And okay, we can we can applaud briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Next to him is Seleshi Bekela Abulacho, who is Minister of Water Irrigation and Electricity for Ethiopia. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Seated in the middle is Torben Möger Pedersen. He is CEO of Pension Denmark. Is that the right way to pronounce pension? In Danish, more or less? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to you. <laughs> and next to him is Mr. Amadou Hot. He's Vice President of the African Development Bank. Welcome. And finally, I'm very pleased that we are joined by Robert Orr. He's Under Secretary General and Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Climate Change at the United Nations. Great that you're with us as well. We are looking for maximum interaction in this session, ladies and gentlemen. You've been such a polite audience so far, just listening to all the things we had to say. Now we really want to hear from you as well with your questions and comments. So I'm going to do one round of questions with the panel, and then I'd like to open up for your questions as well. And I'll start here with um, Denmark's Minister of Finance. And Denmark absolutely has taken the lead on a number of public-private partnerships in the area of green finance, such as the Climate Investment Fund and the SDG Fund. So how do you see the role of government, and how can we intensify and accelerate that? First of all, um, what I have been seeing over the last few years is a change where three or four years ago, the problem was lack of finance possibility. Uh, there was not enough interest in financing. What we see now, through the cooperation we have with Pension Denmark and others, that a lot of companies would like to finance, would like to put in the money uh, in, in new projects, but we see not enough bankable projects. The, the projects need to come from ideas to something that investors are ready to invest in. Uh, there's a huge potential out there. Just 2.1 billion people are in shortage of uh, clean drinking water. 4.5 billion needs uh, decent sanitarian uh, uh, access. Uh, we see more than 670,000 uh, deaths uh, a year due to uh, water uh, pollution. So what we need here is to invest more. But to, to lift that investment, it's difficult to come from the idea to a bankable project. So we need as a government to invest more. And we are uh, tasking our Institute for Development Financing to go into this to try to scale up projects so that others can come and finance them. Because the regulatory framework for investments need to be improved in some of the countries we need to invest in. 
And sometimes it's also a question of capacity uh, development, isn't it? I mean, the inability perhaps to define a project in a way that it can be attractive to financiers. Aren't there things there also that government can do to perhaps help build that capacity? Oh, yes, there's a lot of things. One of the things I heard from BlackRock yesterday morning was the need for um, universal uh, language on what is a project, what is sustainability, yeah. so you can actually know what to do and what to look for. If th this are tailor-made every time, it just takes up too much uh, capacity for the investors. So we need to find a way to make this easier for investors to come in and also to mitigate some of the risk that are there. And by the way, I do actually believe that some of the risk are very much lower than anticipated. <coughs> Some of the uh, uh, funding areas that Denmark has uh, supported has come out with much less risk than we thought because the projects are better and the risk are uh, much smaller than uh, perceived in the beginning. Thank you very much. And let me move right down the panel uh, to uh, you, Minister, and ask you, Ethiopia has advanced plans for both climate mitigation and adaptation. We mentioned that uh, earlier when we heard from your president. What's required in order to finance these plans? And how do you see the role of your own government in working to leverage uh, those funding streams? Um, thank you very much. Uh, my government... Uh in the past, used to do you know, mainly public financing. Public financing in the sense that uh, mobilizing finance from taxpayers' money, allocate budget, and uh, look also into overseas uh, development partnership uh, and through the ODA window. So develop this kind of partnership to uh, develop infrastructure and uh, social facilities uh, for people who are at a more disadvantaged position in rural area, most distant places. Uh, but recently, this, this year, we established what you call uh, public-private partnership uh, law, uh, regulatory framework uh, and directives and so on, so that uh, we leverage more from uh, uh, private sector financing. That means <coughs> uh, private sector to be engaged with well-defined policy framework and the re regulatory framework to invest, actually, similar to what is happening in developed countries. Uh, so that, uh, for example, the energy sector be really uh, invested upon, where we have got a lot of potential, but when you take uh, an access issue or reliability of energy supply, it's very, very uh, minimal, like uh, access at the moment is just for 30% of people in terms of electricity. So the 70% cannot be easily met by the public financing. Therefore, the engagement of private sector is very crucial. In that sense, for example, what we are trying to do with the Danish government in the wind energy is very instrumental, which is blending finance from uh, development partnership uh, that may come as um, support to the government of Ethiopia and also mobilizing the financing from the loan facilities that exist in Denmark and blend them together and make it affordable to the country to implement. Are there particular challenges involved there that you haven't quite figured out how to meet? Yes, there are certain uh, challenges. Uh, the speed of actually developing the bankable project that His Excellency just mentioned, the capacity actually to perceive and actually mainstream the re uh, legal and regulatory framework at all levels, from uh, top government level to local level. Uh, that uh, requires real capacity development at uh, uh, national level or regional level where projects are implemented. So in that sense, uh, uh, we are also looking into other models, for example, with the African Development Bank. We look into African Energy Marketplace, where we bring our ideas where to solve critical problems in uh, climate resilient water supply or uh, energy access, off-grid solution, or large-scale investment in uh, energy solutions. So, uh, tagging into those kind of platform, we can really engage with the private sector to come and invest in country like Ethiopia, where there is significant demand. 
interesting that you mentioned speed because that, of course, was what we heard from Amy earlier with all the respect that she did give for the Ethiopian government, but she, but she did tell us sometimes things are a bit cumbersome, move a bit slowly. So um, that kind of echoes it from the other side. Thank you very much. Let okay. me um, go to uh, Mr. Peterson. And when I work in financial sector fora, I often hear discussions about, well, we'd really like to invest in infrastructure, but actually it's very difficult. We have solvency too, and you know, we can't, sometimes we can't really quite figure out how to structure it. But in fact, Pension Denmark has premiered some very interesting models in this area for rolling out institutional capital to uh, finance infrastructure, both in the developing world and in the area of renewable energy. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the basis for that approach and what is needed to leverage further capital from the institutional investment sector where, which is just a wash in money, to really target these needs. Well, uh, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to share our experiences uh, with you and with the audience. Well, first, I think I have, I promised my, my daughters to say that it's a little embarrassing once again, to sit in an all-male uh, panel. So, <laughs> Melinda, I'm very happy that here you, you're here. Here I am. The token. <laughs> so, but uh, you're perfectly right. Uh, if, we have, if we are to execute on the SDGs, uh, we have to mobilize private capital at a very large scale. That has been mentioned uh, numerous times uh, during uh, yesterday and, and today's uh, discussion. And uh, we have, during the last couple of years, seen some progress, as uh, the minister uh, said uh, in his uh, intervention. But much more is, uh, is needed if we have to generate capital at the necessary uh, uh, scale. And uh, as you know, uh, at the end of the day, for institutional investors, it all comes down to risk-adjusted uh, rates of return. The good story is that uh, this uh, low interest rate environment actually creates a need for identifying new types of investments. We are all looking for alternatives. The not so good story is the fact that uh, many institutional investors have a, a say, assessment of risk or a perception of risk investing in developing countries, but also investing in new types of, let's say, renewable energy infrastructure, which uh, counts in the opposite uh, direction. So what we need is to find ways to uh, reduce the uh, real and perceived risk asso associated with mobilizing institutional uh, capital. And one of the ways is to uh, use the, let's say, blended finance uh, model, which is one of the things we have uh, inside into together with the Danish government and also with, with other institutions. We started four years ago with uh, a, a climate investment fund. We then established an agribusiness fund, and uh, earlier this year, we established a much larger SDG investment fund, which is a good example of how to combine public money, state delivers 40% of capital in the fund, uh, private uh, pension fund 60%. Uh, the, uh, all processes are to be uh, uh, are tested for their impact on the SDGs, and uh, they have to fulfill also uh, quite strong uh, financial uh, requirements. Uh, the idea with the blended finance is that um, we have, a, let's say, risk mitigation contract with the Danish government saying that the first chunk of return in the fund will go to the private investors. When we have reached 6% on our invested capital, the next chunk of return will go to the uh, government's uh, equity share. When government also has reached 6%, we will go hand in hand until we both have uh, reached a 12% return. What will, and return above 12% will, for the majority, go to the uh, to government. So we has, uh, traded away some of the upsides to get some downside protection, and we use the, let's say, large risk capacity of the government budget uh, in this uh, structure. It's not a subsidy model. It's, it's a, let's say, uh, uh, market-based uh, distribution of uh, returns. From a government point of view, they could leverage much more money than if you only had to depend on the government budget. We get access to a structure where we couldn't be on our own. and. Uh, get access to, let's say, attractive projects, which also uh, give our contribution to, to the SDGs. But not only public-private uh, structures are uh, a solution. We also have uh, established uh, what I could, we could call private-private uh, partnerships. 
Last year, we established a new fund called the Africa Infrastructure Fund uh, as a joint venture between uh, the uh, large shipping company, AP Miller Mask, and uh, four Danish pension funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and why did we do that? Because uh, AP Miller Mask uh, has a, a decade-long uh, experience in uh, uh, Construction are operating large container terminals in a number of African countries. So we have taken in uh, people with this uh, skill set, this experience, and put in. Uh, they are heading the, uh, the, this fund, which will, during the next five years, invest somewhere between one and uh, five billion US dollars in a number of uh, infrastructure projects in uh, in Africa, ports, uh, toll roads, uh, energy infrastructure assets. So in both cases, we have teamed up. We have established partnerships with people who are bringing something at the table which we don't have ourselves, and uh, we can provide long-term uh, capital, and I think this is uh, one of the ways going forward. The other thing to stress, if, if we have to reduce risk, uh, we have to say to the receiving <coughs> countries, countries who want to get us on board as investors, it's very important that you work with the development of, let's say, investor-friendly infrastructure in your countries. It has something to do with so, um, uh, the uh, regulatory framework, uh, respect for property rights, uh, free flows of uh, capital. Yeah. And I would like to bring your attention to this report uh, published a few days ago, uh, headed by uh, Mr. Tarman, uh, where they say, what is the future uh, task for the international financial institutions? Or maybe you will come back to that. And they say the most important number one uh, task is to help uh, countries help governments to establish an investor-friendly environment in able to attract these large pools of capital uh, floating around out there. So let, let us take that topic right on to, in fact, the next speaker. Yeah. Many thanks to you, Mr. Peters. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know what Pension Denmark is, perhaps, uh, it is, in fact, the pension fund for Danish workers. So another example there, uh, I think, yes. of the kind of labor private sector cooperation that we heard about yesterday morning from Karsten Dubvad uh, as well. So let me go now to Amadou Hot. And uh, indeed, I'd like to hear more about the role of development banks yeah. in this picture, but also perhaps in terms of policy frameworks. What can you do to ensure the kind of policy reliability and stability that investors are looking for? Because as we know, whether we're talking about development or energy, that is so essential for investors to feel secure enough to want to invest. Uh, absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just to quickly to say that the African Development Bank has launched the High Five, which is the strategy for the bank over the next uh, 10 years. And a UNDP report assessed that if Africa executes and implements the High Five, 90% of the SDGs will be achieved. So the strategy of the bank is kind of an accelerator for the High Five. And the number one High Five is lighting up and powering Africa. So what the banks is doing in that area, many things, many ways. We, we know that basically the bank's resources and the MDB system's resources is not enough to basically help us achieve what Africa needs for the next 10 years. So what we are saying is that how can you utilize the public resources, MDB resources, to multiply and attract massively private sector money? You can do it two ways at the African Development Bank. We are looking at attracting private sector, the institutional money, through the front door and then through the back door. The front door is basically to say, how can you uh, 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 work the regulatory environment, make sure that the African governments are taking, doing the right policies, like in Ethiopia, having the PPP, for example, framework that was cr critical, but also mobilize concessional money to prepare bankable projects. And we have one concrete example that we managed to basically uh, uh, utilize to help investors. This is the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa. This is a $90 million multi-donor trust fund that was anchored by Denmark with $50 million out of the $90 million through Danida. And through that project preparation facility, we managed to prepare about 600 megawatt of renewable energy projects in Africa, mobilizing about $1.5 billion investment. So this is through the front door. This is number one. And then through the back door, investors always talk about risk, risk. They don't want to take construction risk. For example, Pension Denmark will rarely invest into 
uh, uh, greenfield project. So what we did at the bank, we created a structure called a room to run. Basically, what we said, what we did was to transfer the risk of the bank's projects to the institutional investors later on in the game, once the project has started to generate cash flow. So the first ever transaction done by an MDB was executed just a few weeks ago, uh, where we transferred risk and recycled our capital and generated additional capital for the bank, additional headroom, to the tune of $700 million that we transferred to the private sector. The institutional investors would not have come into those projects initially. But because the banks held those projects in its book, will continue to manage the risk associated on those projects with African governments. A pension fund a money manager in the US, and I think a Danish also pension fund was involved, with the European Union providing a $100 million first loss guarantee. So $100 million first loss, the bank's portfolio generated about $700 million of, of new headroom that can go into renewable energy projects. And one of the conditions of the EU was that the, the, the headroom generated should go to renewable energy projects. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Um, I need to ask a question now. Oh, great. Okay. I'll, I'll just work on my microphone while I'm asking a question. Um, and that is the following, a, a follow-up question to you, Amadou, if I may. Um, because in terms of, so should I use the, no. Okay. Um, um, in terms of working with um, governments in, to establish um, enabling policy frameworks, is it difficult for you that there are uh, lenders and cooperation partners out there who basically are coming into African uh, capitals and saying, no strings, um, we'll work with you no matter what approach you take. Uh, does that make it harder for you to do that kind of work of, I, I don't want to call it conditionality, but trying to work with your uh, government partners to uh, establish those policy frameworks that we're talking about? The, the policy fr uh, frameworks are absolutely fundamental. Without that, we cannot uh, attract the massive resources that we need. Some of the conditionalities we see from some partners is basically to work with maybe uh, 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 their businesses, their companies, for example, right? That we cannot do it as an MDB. We have to open uh, the whole system, all the financing to all the corporations around the world. So we, we, we tend to basically uh, not move that way, but basically work with the government to uh, uh, help have the right policies, have a, a concessional money to prepare projects, but also have a tripartite dialogue between one, the private sector, two, the government, and three, the MDBs, instead of each of them doing some one thing bilaterally with the government. So we started this with the Africa Energy Marketplace uh, in July, where we gathered five countries, focused countries, including Ethiopia, where the Minister of Energy was there, the various ministers of energy, discussing in a room, hard talk, what are the problems? Why we cannot invest more in your country? And Ethiopia, for example, through that uh, uh, discussion, we had a, 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 an action plan that required the government, for example, to pass certain bills, to sign, for, to ratify the New York Convention on arbitration awards. And those are critical, and the government undertook to do them, and also to increase the uh, electricity tariffs. And now electricity tariff has been increased, which is better or for the investors that will make the, the project more bankable. But two, also at Parliament, we are hoping in the next two to three weeks, mm. the New York Convention will be ratified. And three, also the government has passed the PPP law. And these are the kind of things we want to see government do, and we are pushing uh, the government to go for it. Thank you very much, and I'll come now to Bob Orr, who was closely involved uh, both in the preparations for the Paris Climate Summit and also uh, the work that's been done since then. A major topic then and now, in both cases, has been means of implementation, uh, including fund funding mm -hmm. flows. And so I wonder if you could just tell us, from your point of view as having been part of this whole process, what do we need to do right now to really get to where we need to be on this? Because again, we're not, we're not where we want to be, whether it's the Green Climate Fund or the various other uh, funding streams that, uh, that we've put uh, into place, but uh, it's not enough. 
I love this term that I've heard here today of governance unusual. Um, what we have to do right now is practice governance unusual. Um, 20th century rules about investment and how money will flow uh, really aren't going to do the job. We really have to practice 21st century governance. And that means there are multiple stakeholders at the table. Uh, government has to create its enabling environment, uh, but uh, I, there's all this financial expertise on this panel. For me, it's really very simple. Money likes return and dislikes risk, and it's going to flow when those basic conditions are met in varying degrees. And it takes a broader set of actors today to lower the risk and to raise the returns, because the returns are not just financial returns. They're social returns. There are other bottom lines here. So yesterday, I sat through a very interesting set of pitches from the Closing the Investment Gra Gap group of countries. And I listened to Ethiopia and Bangladesh and Jamaica and Vietnam make their pitches. They weren't competing with each other. They had competitive pitches that were racing to the top. There's plenty of capital in the room listening to their pitches. A lot of money to go around. They were learning from each other what was needed to be able to attract that investment. What is the regulatory framework? What are the tariff rates that you're using in your country? This race to the top is exactly what we need in the climate change space in particular. Uh, there is plenty of money out there, but it's only going to flow when those uh, conditions are met on the ground and it takes governments to do what governments have to do, but they're partnering with international institutions, multilateral development banks, civil society organizations. Uh, it's a broader group of actors. So this governance model takes a little more work to bring all those actors into the room. But when they're there, as we saw with these pitches yesterday, I dare say the four countries that we're pitching are going to see some investment in the coming months uh, because they've learned from each other and they're not competing with each other in a negative sense, they're competing with each other in a positive sense. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you a quick follow-up? Because as you were speaking and you were talking about uh, uh, re rent, uh, return and risk, um, I was thinking about the role of NGOs uh, in battling corruption. Um, because, of course, corruption is a risk factor, ultimately. Um, could you say a word about that? Absolutely. Um, and what I would describe as the old model, NGOs are, are this other out there that are not part of the governance equation. They are most certainly, in the 21st century, part of the governance equation. Uh, lowering the risk of corruption, uh, transparency is so critical to making money flow. Um, and NGOs can play that role in a very constructive way, or they can just play hardball and make it difficult to see any money move at all. Um, bringing NGOs into the equation up front improves the situation vastly. Uh, if you wait till the back end to, to just let them be a part of the chorus that is either you know, saying this is a bad investment or a good investment, you've missed the most formative time. At the UN, what we've been doing since the Paris Agreement is making sure we're brokering these spaces where NGOs, multilateral development banks, uh, countries, sub-national governments can all be in the room together. And when they are all in the room together, that governance unusual equation shows up. Yeah. In other words, partnership rather than adversarial uh, concepts. Yeah. So let me open now to the audience. And if you have a question, I'm not sure whether we have microphones. Do we have microphones somewhere in the room, or am I going to go down to the audience with my microphone? Maybe that's what we're doing. So we're going to put the lights up so I can see you. Could we have the house lights on? Hello, technicians. <laughs> um, oh, well, I'll, I'll go here, and then I can see you too. Who would like to ask a question to the panel? Don't be bashful. Very good. I'll just stoop down to you. All right. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the wonderful delivery. My name is Nazmul. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, my question uh, to His Excellency, the Finance Minister, to Denmark, you uh, mentioned two very important points which I loved. 
One is, you mentioned that there is now this lack of availability of bankable projects. And you also talked about this risk perception, mm. uh, mentioning that this sometimes uh, probably too much, not, not, not good to be true. So from Bangladesh perspective, I would just like to inform you that many of the projects, bankable projects that you would be, uh, you are looking for probably some of them has, have moved to countries like us. So please look for bankable projects. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. One more point. And on the risk perception, uh, this is something that's really hard for us. While we are trying to develop a very good bankable project, giving very good risk-adjusted returns, we are making significant progress on the legal and regulatory framework. Still, we find it very difficult to attract the private sector, in, in, in particular the institutional investment back in the country. Uh, the point that keep on uh, hitting us is, uh, uh, although the countries are growing, uh, they have beautiful track record in providing very good returns over the years. It's still, the basic point of uh, the, uh, the you know the ratings of the country, the international sovereign ratings are still not investment grade. Now, this is something we cannot really overcome immediately, but the uh, investment requirements are immediate. Uh, I would like to pick the brains of the distinguished panelists, how we can really come out of this immediately, not waiting for a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to ask all panelists to weigh in on all subjects, but uh, who would like to pick up on that? Maybe Mr. Peterson, for example? Well, I think that uh, uh, things are actually progressing uh, quite rapidly, in, rapidly in, the, in these years. We have developed a number of new uh, blended finance investment vehicles uh, the work by uh, the uh, Tatman uh, group uh, is very promising. So I think that uh, uh, compared with only, let's say, five years ago, we now have a number of uh, ways to, let's say, match institutional capital from our part of the world with uh, good projects in uh, both developing countries but also developed uh, countries. And uh, I think uh, the, so the, the, overall, uh, the overlayer of all these uh, initiatives is that you have to develop new types of partnerships where you combine skills which you, in the old days were separated. So when we work together with the Danish government uh, in developing countries, we get access to uh, uh, political protection which we couldn't, couldn't get uh, on our own. Uh, when we work together with big industrial companies like AP Middle Mask, we get access to very specific skills and uh, networks. And uh, on the other hand around, they get access to our capital. So I think that uh, the way is to develop further uh, the idea of a new type of partnerships between partners who not teamed up uh, in the past and share these experiences uh, with each other. I mean, yeah. the, the Danish uh, HD investment fund is very easy to uh, duplicate uh, in, in other countries. Uh, and we will uh, be very happy to, to share uh, all the details on on the, on the construction with, uh, with, with you here, out here. And maybe I would, my last remark on, the, on that, maybe you also, many of you are engaged with uh, your own pension funds uh, back, uh, back home. Maybe you also should be maybe a little, little more so active in asking them to be more bold in this area. Mm -hmm. We have decided that uh, we will always invest uh, in uh, renewable energy so that we have uh, the ownership of uh, green power capacity equivalent to the yearly power consumption of our 700,000 members. So we are now the owner of 3,000 plus megawatt of, uh, of green power provided by wind farms, solar plants, uh, biomass power plants, which uh, is a very compelling story. I can tell my members that I'm not only providing you with good returns on your pension savings, I'm also providing you with green power. So when you put on the light in your house, it's uh, green power from your own wind farm lighting up your house. Great. I think you should uh, ask your own pension funds to allocate uh, a similar uh, Here's amount the benchmark. of assets. Here's the benchmark right here. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, you had an idea as well. Well, yeah. Uh, as we said, uh, th there's plenty of capital out there. And in a low interest society as we have right now, capital are looking for good investments. And the risk has been perceived as much higher. But I do believe that there is a gap between when you change things and when it's realized that things have changed. And we need to be impatient, but also need to realize that things take a bit of time. And you need to showcase the good story. And the good story in Denmark is that we created this financing institution 
to uh, mitigate risk and, and to support companies that were taking a bit higher risk. But we haven't spent all the money we put into it because the risk was actually quite much lower than we expected. So what we see right now from Bangladesh and from other Asian countries and from African countries is that risk perception is higher than risk reality. And we need to tell that story many times to many investors before they begin to invest the money where we see the pro problems and, and the bankable projects are. So please be impatient, but realize that things do take time. That really gets at the very nature of risk, doesn't it? The fact that the more knowledge and experience you have, uh, the less uh, risk you often do perceive. Not always, exactly. but... Um, exactly. Bob Orr. I was just going to say that risk perceptions have proven very sticky uh, to the point made uh, by our Bangladeshi colleague, and it has prevented capital from moving to places that clearly uh, the risk is lower than what it's perceived to be. Um, I was very struck yesterday in the pitch, and I see the Jamaican representative there. He made a very interesting point during his pitch about uh, the prioritization of uh, renewable energy across very different political administrations in his country. Um, doing that snapshot across the politics to say this is shared across the entire political spectrum over many years in my country takes a whole chunk of the political risk out of the equation. You know, the, you know, when you're looking at a 10, 20, 30 year investment, you know, political risk is, is not small, uh, in not a small part of the equation. So I, I think there are ways to do that. And, and I think this kind of thinking and getting these kind of partners in the room helps to diminish that stickiness in the risk perception. I see Amadou would like to say something as well. Do that while I start moving toward the audience to get another question. Yeah, just quickly to break the gap between perceived risk and real risk is really the guaranteed products that the MDBs have, but also that uh, generous donors such as Danida and others have as well. Uh, you know, you, you provide a guarantee, but you know this guarantee will not be exercised, or well, the chances to be extremely low. Mm -hmm. You enable the pension fund to come in because then they, they're more risk averse. And, and then the other idea also to, to sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, find a solution <coughs> for Bangladesh is to co-invest with Asia Development Bank, to have institutional investors to co-invest with the bank who is more capable to manage all the risk associated with the project. Could we have the lights up again, please, in this room, if possible? Thank you. Um, my name is Irving Mincer. I'm a professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. And I want to um, ask a question that follows on to the minister's uh, statement about sticky perceptions of risk. One of the places where we've had conversations around risk of financing is the outgrowth of prudential regulation that came in the follow-up to the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis, leading to the, the decisions of the Basel Committee producing Basel III and Solvency II. In some ways, the, the, the efforts that we've taken to, to protect the stability of the financial system through the implementation regulations for Basel III and Solvency II hinder the ability of institutional investors and others to proactively support investments in sustainable infrastructure. Is there an opportunity now to bring together our conversations about risk related to financing sustainable infrastructure in response to climate change and the changed conditions that might suggest n new thinking about recognizing investments in sustainable infrastructure as secure and liquid, allowing greater opportunities for financial institutions to invest in sustainable infrastructure. Very glad you asked that question. Let me put it to the minister. Well, I, I do think that you have a good point here because bankers now are looking very much in what kind of grade their investment will get. And if infrastructure would get a better grade, it would be more interesting for them to, to invest in. Of course, none of us would like to go back to what we had a decade ago. Uh, so we need to be very careful in, in how to move forward on this. But when we can see that infrastructure projects in developing countries 
are being more sustainable, are being economic, vinyl, uh, uh, sustainable as well. We must change the way they're weighted, so it's more possible for them to, to go there. Uh, because Denmark is doing what you said through the NIDA. We're mitigating, we're lowering the risk, it's making it easier for others to come in. But we can't be there in, uh, in, in any country, in every country. We need to be there to, to showcase it and then have the market change regulations so the market forces will let the money flow into the projects that are needed. Thanks very much. But, but maybe you okay. know that the, the European Commission uh, recently has uh, reduced uh, solvency requirement when uh, pension funds are investing in infrastructure. Actually, they have halved uh, the solvency uh, requirements. So that has been very supportive, uh, actually. Let me uh, go to the yeah. Ethiopian uh, minister briefly, if you would, because I've got three more down here. So I'm going to try to bundle those three after that. Please, minister, yeah, go ahead. I just uh, want to add a few points. Uh, on one hand, we have uh, usually risk mitigation mechanisms uh, in all, most of projects uh, that is coming through the private sector. Uh, that means uh, banks, IFCs, and so on, providing these risk guarantee mechanisms. That is one. Normally, private sector doesn't come just uh, simply without proper implementation agreement. Within those, there are uh, well-defined risk, uh, risk mitigation strategy and buffers that actually prevent us from this kind of perceived risk to happen. And uh, certainly, I think uh, investment, for example, in a continent like Africa is a huge opportunity. We have to really have that strong trust because there are huge economically and technically feasible sites, not only for individual countries, but for neighboring countries, like looking into uh, power pools like in East Africa, that really makes projects uh, very much feasible and attractive, uh, can bring uh, significant profit and uh, reliable operation. Hi, I'm Mark Augusten Boydum from Beta Energy in Denmark. I have a career of working with de-risking projects to make them bankable, and especially in renewable energy, but also in, in other sectors. Sometimes when you've done approximately 100 projects as I have, you, you start having a thought about, are we really looking at risk when it comes to SDG goals in the right way? Because each one of these projects is trying to be de-risked from market exposure risk on power, on technical ability, etc., etc. But sometimes the risks at stakes are higher. What risk are we really looking from from a pension fund perspective if the weather starts changing? And all the other risks I think sometimes the balance on risk, are we being too nitty-gritty on small risk on facilitating projects, or should we rather look at the big risk, which is not enabling enough investment into SDG goals? Thank you very much. I'm going to bundle questions, and then we can take comments, perhaps, uh, on the aggregate of those, uh, but essentially uh, getting at the point there that the negative externalities that we uh, avoid are perhaps not properly um, priced into the calculation. So I think you had a question as well, is that right? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Simon Hansen. I work with C40 Cities. And maybe not surprisingly, my question is about cities. Um, we are seeing very rapid urbanization. Cities, for a good reason, is one of the themes at the P4G summit. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because cities are fantastic mechanisms for scaling up solutions, because a solution that works in one urban environment will often inspire other city leaders to take up a similar solution. Cities like Curitiba and Bogota, for example, experimented with bus rapid transit systems, and now we see this solution being deployed in, in cities all over the world. But I think it's, it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say that um, if you look at international financial institutions, development banks, and so on, uh, in the past they have tended to prioritize national governments or other, other entities when looking at whom to support. So my question is, is that likely to change in the future and will we see cities being, being more prominent? 
Okay, I'll try to be short. Troels Dam Christensen from the Danish NGO Network working on sustainable development. Uh, my question is about the balance we need to, to create between uh, government regulations on, because of course the P4G is about creating positive in incentives to create the right uh, in, uh, investments. But what about the other coin, side of the coin, about kind of make, stopping the investments we don't want to do? And I think that's important also here because the, the, the business sector, the ones who want to do the right thing, also is in a competition with people who don't want. And I would like to actually ask Robert Orr about this balance between what are the responsibility for governments actually to, to make the right regulation to stop what we are not going to invest in. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back up here to the stage and with recognition of the fact that I know the minister needs to leave us very soon, mm. let me get your comment on any aspect of that you would like to address, and then perhaps we can let you go, and if mm. others want to uh, comment, they yeah. can as well. Okay. Uh, well, you ask whether cities will take over from governments, uh, and perhaps it's wrong of me to say, but actually I do believe they will, uh, because cities uh, and mayors are perhaps closer to their constituents than uh, governmental politicians and, and they are acting right now much faster and um, so I do believe that cities will uh, take up more space in the discussion in the coming years. Then you ask whether we were assessing the, the risk correctly and um, I think we're assessing the risk that we can see and that we can mitigate. I think it's very difficult to assess risks that are uh, so global as what happened with, if the weather would change, uh, but, but because you need to look into what is your investment. And I can't tell a pension fund that they should invest if they don't get a return, because that is the essence of an investment fund or a pension fund, that it gets some kind of return for the members. So we need to find out globally, politically, how can we mitigate those global risks that you mentioned I think this is the partnership where we as politicians take on us to mitigate those kind of risk where the uh, pension funds are looking at business risk in order how to ensure a return for the members. I'm sorry, but I need Thank to... Thank you very, very much. Let's give the minister a warm round of applause. We'll let him go and keep the other. So let me ask our other panelists, if you have a closing thought on any aspect of the questions that we've just heard, then I'll just uh, go straight down the panel and um, we'll keep it brief because I know you all also want to get to your lunches and your appointments. So please, Minister, if you would care to. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, for me, the biggest uh, risk is uh, risks that is coming from uh, issues like climate change and not achieving SDGs in right in time. Therefore, uh, the global community where finance and capital is available should have the right confidence to move in to really solve the global problem. Uh, therefore, it is very crucial really to interlink what we are talking about for indirect investment financing and the SDGs the ambitions and the intentions that the 17 goals are actually bringing to our world. Thank you very much. Mr. Peterson, and perhaps you could say just a word about uh, the third uh, question in relation to divestment yeah. and getting out of old patterns. Well, uh, maybe we have uh, talked too much about the uh, risk and too little about the opportunities. And I think that as a c concluding remark, I think it's very important to say that if you look into the SDGs, especially into the national action plans uh, adopted by uh, all countries, it's like looking into a huge uh, investment uh, catalog. Uh, so I think that the coming years uh, where we are executing on the SDGs will be maybe one of the biggest uh, business and investment opportunities for, uh, for, uh, for a decade. And I think that uh, businesses and investors who are able to identify the opportunities and create, uh, let's say, creative vehicles to match capital with opportunities will be uh, the real uh, winners. And also I would say that countries who, will, who, are, will be able to, who are able to design their, let's say, legal and uh, financial infrastructure in a modern way will also be uh, the winners uh, in the uh, SDG opportunity uh, area. And that should also be my actually uh, answer to, uh, to uh, the last uh, question. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Amber Duhot? Uh, just uh, uh, mobilizing private sector money is extremely important. That's why the African Development Bank is organizing the Africa Investment Forum, which is the Davos for Investment for Africa. It's going to be on the 7th to 9th of November in Johannesburg. It will happen every year. Heads of states, ministers, institutional investors, project developers, DFIs are getting together to increase the pipeline of bankable projects. And so we invite everybody to join us there to mobilize more resources for Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Babur? I want to take up this last question about what governments shouldn't do. Um, unfortunately, governments, and I say this as a rule, are really good at perverse incentives. Um, oftentimes in the climate equation, we focus on what kinds of new investments we want and how to incentivize them. And we don't stop first and ask, what should we stop doing? And the, what we should stop doing, fossil fuel subsidies are atrocious for the ec economy, for the planet, uh, for the health of the people in the countries in question. But we know why fossil fuel subsidies are there in so many cases. The politics push in that direction. But I think um, if we can uh, learn the lessons from countries that have figured out what not to do on fossil fuel subsidies, uh, we could see some very positive momentum on that side of the carbon pricing equation. The one other thing that strikes me are the perverse incentives that many governments are, are providing uh, for political reasons after storms that are, quote, the 500-year storms that are coming every year now, you know, building back in the same place as a, a determination of national will. We will defeat this, you know, these storms. We're going to build back on that same beach that just got wiped out in Florida. You know, that's not a very smart approach to public policy. So the other thing governments need to stop doing is um, trying to uh, enforce their, their will over nature and instead uh, recognize that to be resilient is to, to be smart about how we're building back. In many ways, that's anti-adaptation, isn't it? Let's please applaud yeah. for Mr. Peterson, who's also leaving us. And I will, I will just wrap it up by making the one brief remark that the one word that never was mentioned here is carbon tax as an essential aspect of what governments could do. Um, but we're not going to talk about it. We're going to say goodbye to Mr. Hawk. <laughs> and before, this is like the game of the 10 little uh, Indians who disappear <laughs> one by one. I'll just say goodbye to our remaining panelists as well. Thank you. With very warm thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and participation. We have a one-hour lunch break, and then we meet back here. I believe it's one. Yes, it is. Um, back here for our award ceremony. See you then.